On August 5, 2012, a white nationalist entered the Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and opened fire, leading to the deaths of seven peaceful worshipers before taking his own life. Among the dead was Satwant Singh Kalika, who died while trying to stop the assailant. Today, his son Pardeep and former Wisconsin white nationalist Arno Michaelis travel the country sharing their story of healing and redemption. Hope Over Hate is a conversation between the two men. It contains detailed descriptions of the shooting. Viewer discretion is advised. Will you please join me in welcoming to Roanoke, Pardeep Singh Kalika and Arno Michaelis. Guys, welcome to Roanoke. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. This is your first time here? It is. This is my yeah. first time here, yeah, yeah. but we've been, um, it's been nice just to, the hospitality, and thank you so much for everyone that came out tonight to listen to us. I had to look up real quick to see which one I was <laughs> and sit under it, so <laughs> appreciate that, Roanoke. <laughs> so what do you think of the Roanoke magic so far? I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I could stay here. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, kind of grew up there. I moved there when I was six years old. Um, I love just the, the hospitality here, the hills. So you all have a Wisconsin feel. Thank you. Well, we're so excited to have you here tonight. We're just going to begin with your stories. So Pardee, tell us about you. What makes you who you are and what brings you here tonight? Mm, that's a loaded, oh, that's a loaded question. Um, so my, my story started off and obviously when I was six years old, I moved to, we moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, grew up there. Um, a lot of my life was spent uh, trying to discover really where I fit in in America. And I know that uh, you know, a lot of people go through this, of this sort of identity search. Uh, when we came to America, there wasn't a lot of Sikhs. There wasn't a lot of Punjabis. Milwaukee, Wisconsin was traditionally a German Polish uh, neighborhood. And for me, fitting in was just kind of questioning, really, who am I? I didn't feel white enough to feel white. I didn't feel black enough to be black. I, wasn't, I didn't feel, at that time, the Latino population in Milwaukee was increasing as well, but I didn't feel Latino enough to feel Latino. At some point, I didn't feel, um, you know, I didn't feel American enough to be American. And then at some point I was like, I don't even know if I'm Indian enough to be Indian. Right? And I know that there's a lot, of, a lot of that of identity searching and who we are and within the intersections of what makes us. But I was able to really discover early on that I could be myself because I didn't have enough Sikhs around or Punjabis around to really kind of go into that culture but I discovered I could be myself and discover who myself was, which was party, which um, I shared at length with uh, the organizers. Thank you to all the organizers and the coordinators. There are too many people to thank. Uh, I just shared to an exhausting amount how much my kids love baseball, how much my boys love baseball. And for me, that was really my first love until my first love came around. And uh, it was a way for me to kind of be accepted. Uh, the funny sounding name, the I don't know what your, you know, your mom and dad dress differently. There's different customs that we follow. But for all of us, the American experience um, shapes us. And when we're in it, we lose a little bit of who we were. Um, and so we, we were losing a little bit of who we were, but we were also gaining a sense of identity by being here. And for me, um, I, just, I just reveled in being of service. And I remember asking my parents, who were small business owners, I, at, at an early age, I asked them, you know, I was like, this can't be it. It, can't, it cannot just be about our business and making money. And, you know, my mom would come to me and say, you, you, before this was a, wor a weaponized word, like, you sound so privileged. I'm like, mom, we gotta, like, somehow, some way, 
we were instilled a deep appreciation for where we were. And that was instilled into us from a very young age. And so once I graduated, I, I was the first one to graduate in our household from uh, a college. And then I went into policing. I was policing for about five years. And after five years, and I was policing in one of the roughest neighborhoods in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It is the inner city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My activity looked like uh, drugs, guns, domestics, violent crimes. We did not write speeding tickets. That was just not a thing of where we were. And after five years of policing, I went into education in the same neighborhood that I was policing in. And I started to work with what the state labeled at-risk high school youth. And I say the state because when I was working with these young folks, um, and here I thought that I was kind of going to help these young folks be a better version of themselves, right? And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we go in and say, let me go help these young folks be a better version of themselves, sort of having a savior complex myself. And what I discovered over 12 years of teaching, over 12 years of teaching, was that these young folks actually helped, helped me discover a better version of myself. And that was where I was when August 5th, 2012 happened. I was summer vacation uh, as a teacher, and what I didn't know on that uh, Sunday, summer, Sunday morning in August was my life was just about to change. Thanks, Pardeep. And, and I know that um, in your book, um, The Gift of Our Wounds, little plug, um, you talk about a, a brief time when your family actually moved from Milwaukee to the south. Uh, and, and we won't get into all of the, the kind of cultural shock uh, realities that you experienced, but that really played into this whole sense of identity as well. Yeah, it, it did. And moving, moving around quite a bit, we moved around um, even from the north to the south. My dad was trying his best not to let us know how much uh, just the atmosphere of racism mm -hmm. was impacting us. He tried to shield us from that. Um, I remember when he first cut his hair or when he first cut our hair, um, when we moved out to the suburbs, we had a, a Klan pamphlet put on our lawn. Um, there was other incidents where my mom and dad were called racial slurs. Um, time after 9-11 where we had to go to our family business and really advocate on behalf of our parents to say that, you know, these people are not terrorists. There was a lot of that, of mm -hmm. just, just navigating what America feels about you. Yeah, thank you. Arno, tell us about you. What makes you who you are and brings you here tonight? Well, thinking of Pardeep's story, it really, to me, embodies the American dream which we all hear thrown around from the time we're young. It's the American dream to come here and realize all this opportunity. And Pardeep's story really is the embodiment of that American dream. His family came here with nothing. They built a healthy, thriving small business. In contrast, I was born with the American dream handed to me on a silver platter. And rather than even appreciate it and take advantage of that, I just wanted to like smash that silver platter up in the air and shun it at all costs. I, I was not grateful whatsoever. I grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, very well to do. Um, and I lived in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. My parents were together. They loved me very much and they let me know that. In fact, my th entire childhood, I was like this golden boy. Every, all the adults in my life from Family to extended family to teachers were just like, he's so wonderful, he's such a genius, he can do anything. And you would think that would be, could be good for a child. But underneath the veneer of normalcy of our family, my father's alcoholism made life really difficult for my mother. Now when I say my father was an alcoholic, most people's minds immediately go, oh, dad was abusive, he was a mean drunk. But dad wasn't really a mean drunk, he was a fun drunk. When my dad was drunk, we were gonna light off fireworks in the backyard and shoot guns in the basement. Party pastor remind me like that's not normal. <laughs> but to me it was normal. 
And as a little boy, that was a lot of fun, actually. We loved it. But it wasn't fun for my mom. And my dad often was doing more drinking than working. And we were living beyond our means in our nice house in a nice neighborhood. So it really fell on my mom's shoulders to sometimes work two jobs to support the family. And her relationship with my dad sucked. They were constantly fighting, usually about financial pressures. And I grew up seeing my mother suffer. And it was really hard for me as a kid. And rather than be a good kid and be like, hey, mom, I love you. How can I help? I just started to distance myself from her and distance myself from my father, who despite his disease loved me very much. And of course, as I distanced myself from the people who loved me, it made my suffering worse. And that's when I started lashing out at other kids. Uh, there's a concept that we both talk about quite a bit. I actually use this as like a personal tool every day, and that's simply that hurt people hurt people. I really believe that all violence in human society, from world wars to mass murders to bullying in the school hallway or a mean comment on Facebook, they all stem from suffering. And if we can remind ourselves that that behavior comes from suffering, it helps us respond with compassion rather than aggression. Now, I was going over this concept with a group of middle school kids a few years ago, and just like party, like I, I get schooled by these kids all the time. I learn way more from them than they may learn from me. And so I'm up here all, hurt people, hurt people, yada, yada, yada. And this 12-year-old girl's like, um, Arno, not all hurt people hurt people. And I'm like, oh. Yes, that's actually really important. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a Buddhist nowadays, and Buddhism 101 is like, if you live, you suffer. So seeing as that all human beings suffer, if we all hurt people because we're hurting, we would be in a lot worse shape than we are right now. Fortunately, most people find a healthy way to process their trauma. It might be through a great family, it might be through faith, or a career, or activism, or the arts, or academics, what have you. But in my case, even though I was presented with all of these things, again, on that same silver platter, I failed to engage with them. And so I, process, I transferred my trauma onto other kids. And I got a kick out of it. It was a rush to see other kids afraid of me. It was a rush to see teachers afraid of me. And it quickly became an addiction. Now, being an alcoholic myself, I, I'm Arnold IV, and all the previous Arnolds are alcoholics, um, I know how addiction works. When I started drinking at age 14, I had three, four beers and passed out. When I quit drinking at age 34, I could drink 18 beers in an evening and still function the next day. And this is just the, the nature of substance abuse. You develop a tolerance for it. You have to keep escalating the substance in order to get the same kind of buzz. My antisocial behavior functioned in the exact same way as a kid. So it got boring just bullying this one kid one-on-one, -on -one, so I would get the whole school bus to beat him up. When that got boring, I would get in fights in the schoolyard, breaking and entering, vandalism, start drinking myself at 14, it's gasoline on a fire. By the time I'm 16, I am a full-blown alcoholic. I've been violent since I was a little kid. Violence was second nature to me. And hate was honestly just like another part of the thrill. And that's when I was exposed to white nationalism through white power skinhead music. That began a seven year stint as a neo-Nazi from 1987 to 1994. I, it was the most miserable time of my life. I was very fortunate that throughout that time though, there were people I encountered, namely people that I claimed to hate. People like a Jewish boss, a lesbian supervisor, Afro-American, Latino, Asian coworkers who treated me with kindness when I least deserved it, but when I needed it most. And in doing so, they not only set an example for me of how human beings should treat each other and how life could be if I set aside all these ridiculous ideas that were driving my identity, but they also put themselves in a position of power by dictating the rules of engagement to me. Everything I did back then was meant to provoke hostility. So when people got in my face about me being a violent racist, they were putty in my hands. Now, I'm a big, gnarly, scary-looking dude. I was back then as well. But I've never been particularly coordinated. I'm not an athlete like party. 
I, I played football and wrestled. I could like smash people, but I couldn't catch a ball or throw something or anything like that. But when I would get in fights, I would get the snot kicked out of me just as often as I may beat other people up. And not once did the violence make me any less violent. Even when I got beaten really badly, I got my head busted with a lead pipe, a baseball, I could go on and on about all the, the injuries I've had. But when people treated me with kindness, they were dictating the rules of engagement to me. And saying, instead of letting you make the rules, I'm going to make the rules, and this is what they are. Kindness, forgiveness, compassion. That led me out of hate in 1994. And that's what brings me here today. Thank you. So to build on that a little bit, Pardeep, um, one of the things that you both write about in your book and as you tell your stories are those, those people who were kind to you, who loved you through all of this and who continued to extend that kindness and that inspiration. Pardeep, can you share with us about your father and others in your family who continue to inspire you? So my father, when he came to this country, um, I saw him struggle. I saw him try to navigate uh, what it meant to be an Indian, Desi, Sikh American. And I saw him struggle through all of that. And I know that one of the days that broke his heart was one of the days that he had to cut our hair and assimilate. Uh, and watching him do that, um, you know, we, we, there's always, like, when, when you're first generation, uh, in any, any, any language, any culture, there is somewhat of a difficulty in communication. And sometimes with fathers and sons, that looks like a difficulty in the communication of love and of pride. And for me, um, the day that I saw my father really, really be proud of me and realized it, right? And I think that fathers... Again, like, there's one thing to actually be proud, but then there's another thing to actually realize your father is proud of you. Uh, the, the few days before August 5th on August 3rd was my 35th birthday. So the last time that I saw my father alive was on my 35th birthday. And I remember him and I, he, was, he wasn't a person that would drink a lot. His rule was like, I, I'll drink one with anyone, but I would drink two with good company. And <laughs> part of that was his own trust issues, right? So him and I were throwing back a few, and we were just, we were laughing, and uh, at that time I had two beautiful children. Today I have four, I'm blessed to have four beautiful children. But I saw him uh, playing with the kids, and I saw him giving, you know, piggyback horsey rides in the, in the living room, and I, I was like, where was that dad when I was growing up? Because <laughs> my dad was much more strict than that. But I, my dad was also going through a lot of heartbreak. And he, his struggle made it very, very difficult for him to communicate love. And I knew it on my 35th birthday that he both loved me and was proud of me. And so on the morning of August 5th, I was just in a really, really good place in my life. 35 years old, I'm a teacher. For those that are teachers and work in school settings, you know how precious those summers are. So I was just thinking to myself, we've achieved this American dream. We've made it. We got this typical middle class life. We weren't rich by any means. We weren't poor by any means. But we took our vacations. We enjoyed our kids. We had our little house. And I was teaching, my wife was working, and I, and I looked at my parents and I'm like, all of that work that you've done, you've made it. And I had that realization before my father passed. And that specific morning, I get up and we're, I'm taking my daughter to Sunday school. My daughter, my son, and at that time, and, and like this was 2012, the summer of 2012, and in context, that was uh, the re-election summer of former President Barack Obama. And our country had gone through what we saw as a rise in hate the first time that President Obama, former President Obama, was elected. And this summer 
the, the escalation of what was happening during that election cycle was already ramping up. And so that, this was one of the first, this was the deadliest hate crime committed in nearly 50 years by an affiliated white supremacist. Since the time that four girls endured the impact of a bomb intended for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the civil rights era. And so this touched off a lot of the other ones as well and the other shootings that we have seen, the other what we call targeted attacks on faith-based communities. We have seen a rise on the attacks against Jewish community, against Muslim community, against immigrant community, against LGBTQ community, against black communities. We have seen a rise of, of hate against Sikh communities. But some of this was in the political narrative of summer of 2012. I didn't realize all of this at that time. And when you're going through something like that, you're not, it's nothing that anybody ever expects to have to kind of respond and go through an emergency protocol. But I just, I remember some things from that day vividly. And one of those things that I remember vividly was my daughter forgetting a red notebook. And I remember her running outside of the house with this little red notebook and she was so happy. And I was just, I was, I, was in, I was in my own sort of fury about her forgetting a notebook and us having to turn back around and waste $3.50 in gas because I'm that cheap. But I remember her being happy. And, and you know why I remember it? Because I remember that we made our children a priority. And I made her a priority. And that was the only reason that, that, that was the only reason we weren't at the temple 10 minutes earlier when the shooting happened. And I, I would love to think that I, as an athletic, strong, former police officer, could have saved my four-year-old and my six-year-old from a gunman that was going to kill everybody in sight. I would love to think that I'm that brave, but I don't know, and I thank God that I don't have to think about that. And I thank God that they're alive. My father passed that day. He took five shots from close range. And these are things that we found out later. My dad um, was able to fight against this gunman. He was the last person to fight against this gunman. All of his gunshots were right on the side over here. So he was getting plugged from close range. But he was able to fight against that gunman long enough that he didn't attack anybody else. So sometimes, and then for him, the door, the exit door was right there. Um, he could have left at any time, he could have escaped, but he had a responsibility. And so for us, in the aftermath of this shooting, we realized that we also have a responsibility. And that responsibility um, led me to fundraising for families who lost loved ones, for funeral co costs, all of the logistics that people don't see in the aftermath of a shooting. It also called on us to make sure that hate wasn't the last message, that what happened to us wasn't the lasting message, but hope. Hope will be the lasting message. And that is a defiant spirit. That is a defiant spirit saying, no, we're not going to be, we're not gonna be known as the place that got attacked. We're not gonna be known for this because we need to transform this pain into a purpose. And that was really the inspiration of what happened in the aftermath. Thank you so much. Can I share one of my favorite Seth Wants stories? Yeah. So Pardeep's dad, Seth Wants Singh Kalika. And in the days following the shooting, Pardeep, and his brother and other people who lost their loved ones had their idea to start a group called Serve to Unite to bring people together, to transform this atrocity into something that would heal and inspire people. And so this became a school program that Pardeep and I were running. And we worked with kids through elementary, through college. And one summer there was uh, an elementary school that had a picnic and they invited us to go to the picnic. So me and Pardeep and his brother Amardeep go 
And uh, these are awesome kids, too. We're, we're having a blast just hanging out with them. And we were there early kind of setting up. And as the kids arrive, it's always mom with a kid, mom with a kid, mom with a kid. Almost all these kids is mom bringing them. <clears throat> the first dad to bring a kid is a Latino guy. He's, he's kind of sprayed with tattoos. He's kind of like a gangbanger. And uh, he shows up, and he's got his kid with him. And Par's brother goes, uh, hey, congratulations, you're the first dad to here to bring a, bring a kid. And the guy said, well, you know, my, my dad wasn't around a lot as a kid, so it's important to me to be with my kid as much as I can. We're like, oh, well, that's really cool, man, thanks. And then he goes, um, looking at Part Deep and Armor Deep, he goes, actually, you know, the closest thing I had to a dad as a kid was, was one of you guys. And Par's like, what, what do you mean? And he goes, he was one of you guys. He wore a turban. He, he had a gas station. And we're, I could see on Party and in Armadeep's face, like they already knew what, where this was going. And I'm watching this, and, and the guy goes on to say, yeah, there was this gas station I'd pass every day on my way to school. And the guy who ran the gas station, would every day he'd ask me if I was okay and how I was doing, if my homework was done, if I was hungry, he'd feed me. Sometimes he'd give me money. And uh, Party goes... Where was the gas station? And he goes, it was out in 10th and Scott. And that, that guy was part of his dad. Said what? Thank you. S seeing and hearing the depth of um, how that touched you to hear that story and to be present for that for both of you. Every time. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it reminds me a little bit of... Um, how you talk about your daughter and how she came into your life and, and how she was really such a special part of you seeing yourself differently. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll never forget the day my daughter was born. Um, this, it was her mother's third child, so it was kind of old hat for her. And for me, I was I was there when, when my daughter was born, and I remember the nurse whisked her from her mother's womb to this, like, hamburger warmer-looking thingy. <laughs> and I, I ran over there, and I, I looked down at her, and she opens her eyes for the first time in her life, and she sees me looking down at her, and I'm just kind of in awe. And, uh, and then Mom's like, all right, I'm tired now. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I want to relax. And I'm like, okay. So um, in true Arno fashion at the time, I went to the bar, got uh, rip-roaring drunk. I, I remember there was a guy in the bar who won the lottery, and he was buying the whole bar drinks, so that was kind of cool. Um, I would love to say that that moment changed me. And, and again, I'll never forget that moment. It did change me, but it didn't change me right away. In fact, seven days after my daughter was born, I went out with my younger brother. We got in a huge bar fight. I came back home stumbling drunk, covered in somebody else's blood. And my daughter's mother just hauled off on me, telling me I was a horrible dad. I didn't deserve to be a dad. I was a piece of garbage. And I had, I was, I was really, really drunk. And I, I had a big combat dagger next to the bed. And I just grabbed it and I just said, is this what you want then? And I just went, boom, and I just go up, took my left hand off. So I, I nearly was not here to tell this story. Fortunately, Mom was uh, also a skinhead girl who was not squeamish at the sight of blood and knew enough basic first aid to keep me from dying until the paramedics got there. I, I survived that, but the, I, I mentioned that story just to say, show you how little I changed after my daughter was born. And I, and I think it's, it's an important point to make. I've actually met people who are like, well, if we have a kid, that'll fix everything. Then we'll be, we'll be good parents for the kid. And I'm like, yeah, that's a lot to put on a kid. Like, hey, welcome to the world. You've got to fix your broken parents now. <laughs> but that is what my daughter did. Um, the, the final straw for me leaving the movement, as we called it, happened in 1994 when uh, baby mama and I broke up. Go figure, but violence, alcohol, and hate, and racism is not a recipe for a healthy relationship between a man and a woman. I found myself a single parent to our 18-month-old daughter, and by this time, I'm really, like, 
connected to my daughter. And I, I was just in awe of her. And, and she was an awesome kid. Just like super fun and funny and would say all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was just great to be around. And, and my her mother had two previous kids who lived in Florida. When we broke up, she went down there to be by them. She made like a half-ass attempt to take our daughter with her. And then I'm like, no, you're not taking my daughter anywhere. And I, I had, uh, uh, because when my daughter was born, her mother was separated but not legally divorced from her ex, I had to go take a DNA test to prove my paternity of my daughter. And that just like made my resolve harden all the more. And I, I became a single parent. And it was a couple months after that that uh, a second friend of mine was murdered in a street fight after a concert that one of my, that my band had played. And by that time, I lost count of how many people had been incarcerated. So it finally hit me that if I didn't change my ways, death or prison was going to take me from my daughter. So my daughter saved my life then. Uh, being a man of extremes, I went from extreme hate and violence to extreme peace and love in the rave scene. So here I am, a year and a half removed from being a neo-Nazi skinhead, south side of Chicago, four in the morning on Sunday, shaking my ass to house music with 3,000 people of every possible ethnicity, socioeconomic background, gender identity, sexual orientation you can imagine, and loving every minute of it. That was a huge transformational part of my life, but I was also still numbing my past. I added heavy drug use to my already rampant alcoholism. I stopped selling drugs because the prospect of being busted and being taken from my daughter again was kind of thrown in my face one night. And that's when I stopped selling drugs. So again, my daughter saved my life. Later on, after I quit drinking, I uh, fell madly in love with this woman. She dumped me for the guy who ran the Range Rover dealership. I was mad heartbroken. And I fell into this like year-long suicidal depression that really wasn't about this woman. It was about my past and the fact that I had never reconciled it. But again, my daughter snapped me out of that. She literally grabbed me by the collar, and she's like, Dad, she was like 13 or 14 at this point, and she's like, Dad, snap out of it. So, <laughs> snap out of it. And, and with my daughter's guidance, I did eventually snap out of it, start writing, lead me to what I was doing now. So my daughter has saved my life three or four times, and um, we're very close nowadays. We still talk every single day. When I'm on the road, we talk all the time. I actually have to turn my phone off during gigs because I have her on pass-through. And I've been in talks when all of a sudden She's my daughter's calling, yeah. personal ringtone blasts out. <laughs> yeah, thank Because we, we communicate that often. Thank you, Arno. Um, Part AP mentioned a little earlier uh, a little bit about that day, August 5th, 2012. I wonder if you, you could start, but both of you guys just share with us, um, reflect on that day and then your meeting when you met each other in the Thai diner. Um, tell us a little bit about how that day transpired and then how it came for the two of you to meet and begin your work together. So in the aftermath of hate, and I know this now because for the past 12 years, I've been responding to mass, what we call targeted mass casualty events or what's called targeted violence. Uh, become all too familiar with gun violence, especially as it relates to gun violence in the United States. Um, in the aftermath, there are all kinds of protocols that communities go through. There's an actual chart that I have that shows all of this from a mass casualty event to communities coming together through what's known as the heroic phase to the disillusionment phase, then back up through anniversaries and yearly. And so this is what we call communal trauma. And for us, the sick community, the smaller, sometimes the smaller that your community is, the more acutely that you will feel that communal trauma. So if you have a very like small represented community, you will feel that impact much more. And that's why it's so beneficial in the aftermath of that shooting that all of, uh, we've, we had so many community members from different faiths, religions, races, ethnicities, uh, backgrounds come together in the aftermath. Uh, so as, as horrific as that day was, 
um, in real time, it was inspiring this response from broader community to come together. The, the week after that, we were doing media, we were doing just everything that you can do to put on a brave face for the world. We were, you know, we were, we were, and then I remember really saying it to anybody, any, anyone that would go up and would show we, what I thought at that time, weak emotion or crying, I would yank you by the collar and not let you do an interview. I, would, I was literally that sort of like, I, I wanted to defy what happened to us. And I didn't want anybody to look weak, not in front of the camera, but in reality, we were really struggling. In reality, we were, we were grieving, and that's a true emotion. But I was suppressing that emotion to just to, to, to say, no, we're not gonna let this define us. I remember the first time walking back into the Sikh temple, and even just that the day of it, all the triggers that came back about the same weather, the same road that you take, walking in, and I remember all of these people kind of greeting me at the door, and they were, they, they were so excited, which I thought was kind of just strange. Uh, I'm walking back, I'm receiving all of these, these triggers from just a week ago, uh, and they're all excited, they're running to the door, and they're just, party, party. We took out all of the bullet holes out of the drywall. Okay. We took out all the blood out of the carpets. Okay. You know, we cleaned it all up. And I didn't want to ruin their enthusiasm because I was like, you're doing the best that you can. You're doing what you can. But there was a part of me inside that was saying, why did you clean it up? Why were you in such a rush to clean it up? And so I didn't think that we did the proper level of healing or processing. I just thought that we skipped all of that to say, we fixed the drywall, we took the blood out of the carpets, we changed the carpets, we're gonna do our best to just forget that this ever happened. And then I heard little kids, and I would, ear, I would earshot these kids, and they were speaking in Punjabi or Urdu, and I heard them saying things like, and these were eight, nine, ten-year-olds, they were saying, why do these white people hate us? Why don't they like us? What did we do wrong? And, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, the scare, like if you're married, one of the scariest moments of your life is obviously being married and getting married. But this was honestly the scariest day of my life when I saw these kids going through these emotions and questioning their existence, questioning what they mean to this country. And now the best, I fundamentally believe the best of this country is all of the diversity and who we are and what we bring. And everybody should be proud of who they are. Thank you. And I saw these kids wrestling with that communal trauma of shame. And for me, um, for us, this has been a 12 year battle of really trying to empower our own communities, empowering other communities. Well, the first time that, um, you know, as you're going through all of the logistics of doing things, you put your grief on the back burner. Like, I'm that way, that everybody else's grief comes before my grief. Take care of everybody before you take care of yourself. Eat last. And for me, it was wearing on me because I always had to, say the right thing to the right person in the right moment to uplift them. And for me, when I, when I first reached out to Arnold, I reached out to him for the reasons why people do what they do. I wanted to know because the shooter in our situation shot and killed himself after he got into a firefight with police. So he was dead. So I wanted to know why did this white supremacist do what he did? And the only person that I thought could have the answers is the same person who started the organization that the shooter belonged to. And so I reached out to Arnold.
first we uh, we emailed, right? We emailed, then we spoke on the phone, and then after some time we decided to meet out in person. And there was there was something that we were going towards that both of us didn't understand that we were moving towards. And so even when I first spoke with Arno, there was all of these feelings about white people and who white people are. And I was feeling him out because I knew his journey. I knew that he was a, he was a former white supremacist, but then all of these people were like, people don't change. Once a person is racist, they're always racist. And now I would like to think that I'm gonna look this handsome for the rest of my life, but it's probably gonna change. And we have to navigate that change. But the more and more people start to say these things to you, the more it starts to seep in your head. And people are like, party, you're just going through something. You're going through PTSD. You're, you, um, and I, and I, was, I was like, no, no, I, I wanna go out and meet with this person. And so the first time I spoke with Arno, um, I asked him, I said, Arno, where do you want, like, let's go meet out. Where do you want to meet? And he says, what did you say? Iisan. He said, Iisan. Iisan is a Thai restaurant. And when he said that and he told me what it was, I was like, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> in my head, like, white people can barely handle spicy food. <laughs> so if he was still a white supremacist, right, he... <laughs> He can handle spicy food. <laughs> if I would have said, yeah, let's meet for bratwurst and Wiener schnitzel, like we would have never met. Nope, we never would have met. So thank, thank the Thai restaurant for this. <laughs> and then when, I, when, we, when we finally got there, we got to the restaurant, there was still this, um, there were still these butterflies, these feelings. And you can imagine, this is two, two months after the shooting. This is not... We're not, we're not a year later, this is not two years later. This is just a few months after, and I'm looking for answers. And as I, you know, as I approach the, the Thai restaurant, I see Arno kind of walk by me. And Arno, he, he, he's, he is a big guy. And that day was a colder evening in Milwaukee, and he's walking with this hoodie on, and there's a part of me that was just like, Pardeep, you have a few kids and you can use the old kid excuse, which is, my kid got sick, <laughs> right? The kid did not get sick, they just didn't want to come to the Thai restaurant. So, so but, and, and as I sort of put my foot on, you know, as I'm thinking of, of an excuse of why not to show up because everybody's conversation and what they're thinking was seeping into my head that he's still a racist, that somehow he's going to attack you and this is, you know, whatever it was, um, there, was, there was another hand. And this hand was like, you came this far. You came this far. Party, have the courage to go ahead and meet this person. And this particular, it's an annoying hand sometimes. This is an annoying hand that all, is always kind of like pushing you forward. And when I saw him uh, for the first time, he was, he was flanked by two Asian waitresses, and he's standing right in the middle waiting for me at the front door. Who waits for somebody at a restaurant at the front door? So, but what I thought in my head, even at that time when I saw him flanked by these two Asian waitresses, was, oh, that's good that he didn't eat the Asian waitresses. <laughs> See, my subconscious was firing, right? And I thought this person was a monster. But I'm still kind of going forward of, of meeting this person. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say to him? What is he going to say to me? I know I want these answers, but I don't even know what to ask. And, and, and what, what if I say something that's wrong? What if I don't answer what I need to answer? What I've, so all of these speculatory thoughts of anxiety. Right? And the first time that I saw him, so he comes walking through the door, and he's got this big piece of tape above his eye. But I, I need to establish like my mindset at this point also. And so when August 5th happened, I was kind of on the tail end of my information technology consultant career. I, I was 
working uh, at a client's and bouncing servers, and I'm sure I'm the only IT guy to ever do this, but as the servers are bouncing and I'm watching progress bars of updates installing, I'm dipping in my social media, and I saw this hashtag on Twitter, what was the artist formerly known as Twitter, and it's flying down, it says like sick temple shooting, multiple people shot, multiple shooters possibly, seen not secured, and I'm watching this go, and I just like had this gut feeling that I had something to do with it. I recorded a video that day just of my feelings and saying no matter what we need to like keep compassion at the forefront of all of our response. Later that night it was announced on the news that the shooter was a white nationalist and I lay awake that night wondering this is Oak Creek is, is a suburb about 20 minutes south of Milwaukee. I was active all over Wisconsin back in the day. So I lay up that night wondering if this is somebody I recruited who committed this atrocity. The next morning they said the guy's name, it was Wade Michael Page. He was not from Wisconsin. He was radicalized in 1998 while serving in the US Army. I had left in 1994, so it was established. I didn't know this guy personally, but the more that came out about him, he was a member of the gang I helped to start. He was in a white power skinhead band. My white power skinhead band was really popular. I would be stunned if he had never heard of my band. It was likely he was a fan, and it may have like been his inspiration to start a band himself. In many ways, he was exactly who I used to be. I spent the, that week doing media as well. It, it, it wasn't my community that was attacked. It wasn't my father who was murdered. It wasn't my place of worship that was assaulted. But it was difficult for me in the sense that I went public with my story in 2010. And from the day I went public and people started like wanting me to speak and they're trying to pay me for speaking engagements, I'm like, I don't deserve to be paid. Like I, I shouldn't be congratulated for just trying to be the good person I should have been all along. Um, that that was like my kind of self-flagellation approach to everything. And at the same time, I really, I loved what I was doing. I loved telling stories. I loved working with people. I was working a lot in the inner city of Milwaukee, helping, like mentoring young people and helping kids develop nonviolent problem-solving problem techniques. But I, I, you, I was doing IT for, for money. And so I'm in this trans, transition phase going from IT to whatever it is I do now, storyteller guy or whatever. And in a really messed up way, the sick temple shooting was the best thing that could have ever happened to me in that regard. Because I did media for eight to 10 hours a day for the next four days straight. I was on every big media platform, CNN, Fox News, ABC, NBC, CBS, BBC, CBC, Australian radio, Norwegian newspapers. I was just like blowing up everywhere. And it, it was such a blur that I could barely keep track of what was going on. I remember on the Thursday, the shooting happened on a Sunday, I, was, I just got done doing a Vancouver radio thing when the CNN bit I did the day before dropped. And my email box starts blowing up. All my social media starts blowing up. Everybody's like, oh, this is so wonderful. You're so great, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I lost it. I, I just, I had a nervous breakdown. I was just hysterically sobbing for a good couple of hours. And I was just like, I, I will go back to bouncing servers if it could bring these people back. Like, I don't want this. This is not how I want to succeed. And, and it weighed upon me. It was really difficult. That following Sunday, a week later, there was a vigil. There was, um, I was asked to speak. I came and did a little three-minute bit. Believe it or not, I can do a three-minute bit. Um, well, with the proper motivation, I guess. But anyway, I, I was there, and, and there was a guy from the Sikh Coalition there named Jagjit Singh. And he came up to me afterwards, and he's like, man, I saw you on media, media before, and that talk was awesome, and I just want to let you know how glad we are that you're saying what you got to say, and you're telling that story. It's super important. And I, I just lost it. I'm like, you guys see, I'm a crier. And I, I started crying, like ugly crying, right in front of Jagjit. And he's, he's got this beautiful suit on. I, I'm not a suit guy. I'm like a $1.50 thrift store Hawaiian shirt guy. And Jagjit, with this beautiful suit that I shudder to think how much it cost, he's like, 
takes me in his arms, and he's like, it's all right, man. He's like, I, I, we're glad you're doing this. We, we, we want you to keep going. And I was like, I'm getting snot all over your suit, man. I'm sorry. And he's like, no, don't worry about the suit. And then I just blurted it out. I'm like, I wish there was more six here. <laughs> like, we need more six in society. And, and that was like a really, it, it helped me keep going from there. So leading up to meeting party, going to, at dinner, I'm still, even though I've been uplifted by Jagjit and, and a lot of other support from people in the sick community, going to meet party now face to face, I was just like, what, what am I going to say to this guy? Like, there's nothing I can say that would be enough. Hey, I'm Arno. Sorry about your dad. Like, I, 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 was, at a, I was at a loss for words, absolutely. And so I'm in the restaurant waiting for him, and he comes walking in. And even you can see my man here, he, he's a jock. He's all buff, and he comes walking in, and he's, you know, all yoked out, and he's got this piece of athletic tape above his eye. And it, to me, he looked like an MMA fighter or something. <laughs> and he came walking in, and I'm like, dude, what happened to your eye? You getting a brawl or something? <laughs> like that was the, That's how the ice was broken. And then he told me that a week earlier, he was bathing his young son and daughter. His son was four, his daughter was seven, and uh, his daughter was reaching that point that every child goes through. You know, when, when a kid's born and they're, like, for a few first few years, they run around butt naked, they don't care, woo! There's this, it's Adam and Eve, they don't even know they're naked, woo! It doesn't bother them. Well, Amaris said seven was just hitting that age where all of a sudden she's like, Dad, don't look at me when you're giving me a bath. Like, it was just hitting then. And party being a father to a daughter, as I am, I know how this is. Like, you, you will move heaven and earth to fulfill whatever that daughter's request is. No matter how ridiculous or how difficult, you're going to make it happen. So Pardeep's trying to give his daughter a bath without looking at her. <laughs> and he knows that if she's not clean coming out of that bath, that his wife's going to let him have it. So he's got to, like, peek back every once in a while to make sure he's getting everywhere. So he's scrub, scrub, peek, scrub, scrub, peek. And he's got this spring-loaded shower organizer in the corner of the bathtub. It's like that spring goes to the ceiling of the bathtub, and it's got the little shelves for shampoo and whatnot. And this particular one had these little hooks hanging down where you'd hang a loofah or something. And Pardeep's wife, Preeti, had told him about a month earlier, like, somebody's going to lose an eye on one of those hooks or something. You should, <laughs> you got to get rid of those. And Pardeep, like every other husband in human history, is like, yeah, yeah, I will, honey. <laughs> and uh, he's, so he's scrubbing and peeking, and he looks away, and this hook goes into his eye, like a hot knife through butter. And he's like stuck on this hook thing. So he grabs the, the hook, and he kind of takes it off, and he's just got it, he's like this now, just trying to figure out what to do. And Amaris sees this, and she grabs the hook and starts yanking on it, thinking she's going to help Daddy. You know, the hook's stuck. I'll help pull it out. She's yanking on the hook. Party can feel his eyeball, like, pulling out of its socket. Fortunately, my man is a former police officer, plus a teacher. He's cool under pressure. So he's like, baby girl, just let go of the hook. <laughs> so she lets go, and he goes up to the mirror, and he, like, just kind of takes it out the way it went in, and blood goes flying everywhere, and... He puts a, a towel over his face, and he's like, okay, kids, uh, get dressed. We're going to urgent care, and, which was two, two blocks away. And as he's walking to urgent care with his son in one arm and his daughter on, on the other arm, he's juggling the cell phone. He calls up his wife. Hey, honey, you, you're going to say I told you so, but... And she's like, you idiot. So he shows up at urgent care, and the doctor, right away, they're like, nope. You, you need to go to the real emergency room for that. And so he does, and the, and the doctor looks at his eye and treats it and says, you, you know, Party, you are a lucky man. And Party was like, really, Rock, Doc, because I don't feel lucky right now. And he's like, well, if that thing would have been two millimeters in, you would have lost your eye. But as it is, it just it didn't do any permanent damage to the eyeball, but it did tear his muscle that controlled his upper eyelid. So, like, in true Punjabi fabulousness, like, he's going to keep going no matter what. So he's got this tape to hold his eye open so he can drive. And he had to, like, manually blink his eye to keep it from drying out. 
And so he tells me this story, and the whole time he's telling it to me, just like you guys, I'm like, oh, ooh. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm squirming. Like, I'm literally feeling his pain. On top of that, I am like my own worst enemy far and away. Like most of the damage done to my body was through my own klutziness. So he tells me this story of klutziness. I'm like, where's this guy been all my life? This is my guy. And, and our, our meeting was really one built on this instant empathy that happened because of this bizarre household accident that happened to him. We sat down for dinner. We ordered a squash curry, number seven on a scale to 10, which will really kick your ass at ease on. And we shared that squash curry. We drank tea all night. I, never, I remember we met at 6 p.m. And, and the reason I suggested this restaurant is this is my jam. I ate there five days a week. I knew the servers. They were, but they were friends of mine, Marion King. I was talking to them while Pardeep saw us in there and I, not eating them. Um, I knew the owners of the place. I knew the chefs. It was like my, my place. And it, and it was almost 10 p.m. when King tapped me on the shoulder. She's like, Arno, we closed 45 minutes ago. Could you guys <laughs> wrap it up? But we had a really amazing conversation. And we talked about, we did talk about the shooting a little bit, but it was mainly talking about our daughters and our fathers and what they had in common. And, and that's when our, our friendship and brotherhood really began. Thank you. It, it feels like the only thing missing tonight is that squash curry right here. <laughs> because this, this truly, tonight has felt like an extension of that first meeting that you guys had. Thank you for being so vulnerable with us, uh, sharing so much about who you are, what makes you who you are, and, and modeling for us what it means to move through our wounds and find that pathway to healing. Um, we've learned and are learning so much from you. So let's give a big hand to Pardeep and Arno. Thank you guys so much.